This is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 6th of December 2016. A podcast about Apache Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anybody working with or investigating big data. My name is John, and as always, here's my ever-excellent co-host, Dave. Hi, Dave. Hello, 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 hello. How are you today? I'm very good. Yeah, I'm really asking this time because it's been a while since we talked. It has been a little while. Um, I hope you all enjoyed our uh, our trip down memory lane and our sort of uh, quick fireside conversations with a variety of guests. Yeah. Thanks again to the guests for showing up. It made it special for us too. Definitely. <laughs> anyway, let's go into the first part of that podcast, as always, with the news we found we scrounged up since the last episode. And I think I got one more than you, so I go first. Go for it. I will go for it. And my first article or articles is actually a three-parter, and it's coming from PayPal. PayPal, one of those companies that's done a lot with Hadoop in the past and in the present as well. And in the last uh, yeah, small month or so, I think the first one is from November 8th, and then there's one from November 15th and November 18th, so there's a bit of a delay but still pretty recent they kind of um they didn't go to that into all the detail they wanted that i would want them to go into but they kind of show at all the what they did how they changed their own internal data pipeline workflows to make it more uh, i think the, the 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 new word is agile but they're talking about something called the reactive manifesto which i'm going to talk about in a second as well so in the first article, they are explaining how they changed their pipeline between 2014 and 2015, while when they replaced Hadoop, wait for it, wait for it, replaced the Hadoop staging cluster <laughs> by a Kafka uh, interface. Mm-hmm. So in the original, they just dumped everything in, in, in a Hadoop cluster and then copied it to another Hadoop cluster. So they replaced that one with a Kafka stream. And we're talking about Kafka here because they had 2014, 2015, there was no NIFI yet. We still need to keep that NiFi fanboy status of us up and running. And they also talk about changing from Hive and Pig to Scala and Spark. And they actually give, uh, it's not, they're not very large, the articles. I mean, there's also split into three, but everyone is not too big. But they go into just enough detail to understand why they made the choices and why it made sense. So for somebody looking at the current environment and thinking, yeah, I'm getting bottlenecked and this sounds, it feels a bit clunky. This, it was a good read, just giving insight on why they changed, how they changed, how they improved their uh, situation. And the actual reason for these articles and the title, which I'm going to give you now, is from big data to fast data in four weeks or how reactive programming is changing the world. That's a subtitle. So the the idea behind it is that because of the changes they did, moving their Hadoop environment from a Hadoop 1.0 environment to a a new version, Hadoop uh, well 3 something, I guess now, because 2 was something else, that was Yarn. And doing that now allows them to change their existing environment much faster by building extra layers on top, going at putting an extra Lambda uh, layer on top of that. That takes a lot less time than it used to take. So it's a nice read. The first two, uh, the first two parts, I'm going to link in the show notes and detail this little story. So from, uh, second Hadoop cluster to Kafka and then from Hivepig to Scala. And they also explain a bit about their Lambda environment. And they're actually doing real Lambda, not pseudo Lambda. So they're using the same, uh, micro batching in Spark as they do the batch, uh, stream. So that's good. Mm-hmm. And the reason behind that was also a nice insight. The reason that they go Lambda, not just only go streaming, but still do the batching as well, is because, um, as I'm going to quote from their article, we tell our internal customers they can have a close enough number almost immediately and an exact number within hours. Idea yeah. being behind this is that a real-time thing, sometimes there's a hiccup. Sometimes one of your ingests doesn't come or a calculation isn't finished, whatever. So the real-time streaming will always be just not exactly right but having batches in uh, in the background and some of those batches run every hour and others run every week or every day so at every uh, the, every one of those increments they kind of correct the number which they gave in an earlier time it's a it's a nice i i've always thought about doing it like that obviously obviously but never had it spelled out like this so it was a nice read did they um give any sort of 
sort of stats as to you know how how their pump pipeline sort of overall changed in terms of you know, durations that they used to take with old technologies versus new or anything like that? Um, not really, because there the articles don't really uh, um, uh, compare products. They're really comparing the data came in from this point and it took. X amount of time to have the finished products with all the things in between, and then we change this part and then that part and then this part. So there's never a point where they can really do a benchmark. And it's not really a benchmarking article either. It's more of a conceptual, these are blocking things, these are mm. limiting how we can evolve this environment in the future. So let's make these things more, sorry, agile uh, yep. and make, make it a, a, yeah, a modern system to make it run. And they all, have you heard about the uh, reactive manifesto? About reactive programming? No. Well, apparently, no. it's something. It is a website. I'll link it in the show notes as well. And it's about, I mean, you, you, you get the thing like object-oriented programming. That's the whole paradigm yep. of how you program. This is not really that. I mean, it's part of it, perhaps. But it's more about how you think about programming, having loosely coupled system, message buses, and stuff like that. To allow, well, if you have a, de- a loosely coupled system, it allows a lot more flexibility to change your flow. So. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a one page. I'll, I'll throw it in there just for fun. And the third article I put in there wasn't really related to the first two, but it's by coincidence in between them. Uh, the first two articles were written by Michael Zelter, and the third article is from Mansi Mahendru, who was talking about Storm. <laughs> So it's kind of funny that at the same time they have articles coming out losing Spark and Spark streaming and articles about Storm. So PayPal, they really use everything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, organization like that that's very, very Hadoop-driven anyway, it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that they've got uh, different clusters doing different things at their sort of scale. Yeah. It also read a bit like there were two different departments doing the two different clusters. So it might also be yeah. a little bit of the not invented here syndrome that uh, oh, Department 1 started doing Spark stuff, Department 2 started doing Storm stuff, and they just went their own way a bit. But, uh, well, if they do the reactive programming, that shouldn't matter because if it's all nicely decoupled... We should all talk to each other without any problem anyway. Yes, of course it will. Anyway, right. PayPal, good guys, good reads always. Over to you. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so um, my article, and my favorite article of the week actually is, uh, and I have to uh, credit my friend, my friend Andy for uh, pointing me in the direction of this particular post. Uh, and it's... Um, it comes from the official account for Singapore's open data portal, um, data got data dot gov dot sg, um, and it's it's basically how they caught. I mean, the, the subject of the uh, article is how the Circle Line rogue train was caught with data, um, <laughs> which is just brilliant. But essentially, over the last couple of months, shouldn't they just not lose one in the first place? Well, so <laughs> no the. It, the problem was that they didn't know what was happening. So over the last couple of months, there's been like a, a strange issue on the uh, on Singapore's um, metro on the Circle Line where there's been some mysterious disruptions. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, the, uh, the metro system in Singapore is incredibly heavily used. And um, they had this sort of strange incident where there would be a, a sort of some form of interference would happen, which would lead to a loss of signal, which means that the you know, trains would lose their connection to um, you know, to central control, and that would that signal loss basically triggers the emergency brake feature in those trains and causes them to stop very very quickly and randomly <laughs> along the tracks. Um, <laughs> Which, as I'm sure you can imagine... Well, it makes your daily commute a bit more interesting. Yeah, I'm not that sure that's really what I want out of a daily commute. Um, but these incidents have been happening since August um, and seemed to occur at random. Of course, nothing is ever truly random in this sort of space, but they were, they were finding it really, really difficult to actually pinpoint the exact cause. So um, these guys got the uh, the sort of... Uh, the data sources uh, together, which contained the date and time of each accident, or sorry, incident, I should say, the location of the incident, <laughs> the ID there. of the train involved, yeah, very important distinction, and the direction of the train. Um, and then all of the other, um, uh, you know, vehicles that were operating in, in the same sort of time. 
So uh, this then actually runs through all of their code. Uh, all of their code is in, in GitHub, and uh, they sort of run through everything in uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, and because the data is from the uh, the Singapore's uh, open data portal, you can actually play with exactly the same data that they saw themselves. And it's this is a it's just a great article article because it runs through. Um, their thought process, most interestingly, so it's mm-hmm. it's quite a it's a good sort of ten or fifteen minute read. Um, certainly longer if you're planning to uh, take a look at some of the code in any detail as well. But it runs through, um, you know, the frequent they, they start looking at the frequency of the time of the day, and it's it's kind of it roughly mirrors the peak and off peak travel time. So that's not really clear. Um, they sort of look at it at the frequency by station, and again, you know, slightly more occurrences on the west side, but you know, not really um, sort of location based. And they look at the frequency by uh, by train, and again, that's not um, you know not particularly um, informative either. And then they start visualizing the data, including sort of um, time. Uh, location and direction. So they use um, sort of a a version of the something called a, a Mary chart, um, and uh, you can see sort of the the axis of this, and it sort of has the the times of day um, and the sort of uh, the sort of stations that uh, the the trains stop at, um, and it sort of runs through how you how how you can create those sorts of charts um, and represent that as a scatter plot and then add direction to it. And then as you sort of start uh, zooming in to the incidents, um, they started to draw some correlations and some patterns that, you know, were just not visible beforehand. Anyway, I'll fast forward through this a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. and uh, there's plenty more code to kind of wind your way through. And what it ended up being is it ended up being a rogue train, uh, which I think was passenger vehicle 46. And the interesting thing was that passenger vehicle 46 was essentially um, uh, introducing interference to uh, trains before it and after it. So it in itself was not um, sort of specifically uh, affected by the issues, um, but it was the sort of the the vehicles that were traveling before or after it in the, in the same sort of uh, lines that were having the issues. So it, you know, searching for something that wasn't there in, in in that sort of case. But anyway, really, really, really good article. Um, you know, as I say, all the codes up there, all the data's up there, and a really good explanation of exactly you know how they went through this process, how they found out that. Uh, um, that this was not the, uh, or that this was the the rogue train that they need to then sort out, which I believe is being done now, and uh, normal circumstances should be uh, put together uh, or should be in place as of now. Yeah, while we're rambling on, I've just searched on the the web to find the article. I'm looking through it now too. It's very nicely done. It's got all those graphs there and the little code yeah. snippets. Yeah, it's all in Python really, as well. Yeah. So I understand what they're writing. <laughs> yeah, it's really well done. Using really, patterns. really real, well written or um, well written article. I'd use in Spark. Um, I don't think so. It's all in pandas. It's all in. Uh... Yeah, so you're right. It's all Python. Yeah, yeah, but they're not using Spark. I think. From what no. I'm seeing, I don't see him working with the context. I don't see Spark context being referenced anyway. So no. But no. anyway, machine learning is more than just Spark. <laughs> True. It's, a, it's very nice the way they to do detail everything, show the results, give their way of thinking what we're thinking about. That's the thing I really like is that it's the thought process. Yeah, yeah. They don't just say, "Oh, we did this because we're genius." <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. And in the end, actually, the if I look at the last plot, there it's basically whenever that uh, vehicle wasn't in service, everything was good. So it yeah. must have been related to them, and that's how to that vehicle, and that's how they got it. So it's just an out. Exactly. In the end, it's just a de- detecting an outlier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. De- detecting the thing that wasn't there. <laughs> <sighs> Machine learning detecting things that aren't there. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So really, really good article, and in fact, it's way better than any of the other articles that I'm going to talk about today. But I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, as I say, shout out to uh, Andy for pointing it 
to, in my direction. By the way, that reminds me, if you do have an interesting article uh, that you think we should talk about, then uh, please do drop us a comment Sure. at uh, podcast at roaringelephant.com. Yeah, make our life easy. Dot well. org, even. <laughs> <laughs> you say dot com. I did. How dare did. you? Dot org. And, and then dot org. In this episode of all episodes. <laughs> I know. <laughs> The outrage will become clear later. Anyway, mm. really good article. Really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, hopefully you will too. Yeah, I bookmarked it. I'm going to take a, take a deeper look at it later. Okay, back to me. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, mine is a lot less interesting because this is a very short one, a small one. It's called uh, Managing Spark Partitions with Coalesc and the Repartition. It's by Matthew Powers on the Medium website. Never heard of the website, but it's a very short article, but it just nicely displays how Spark internally partitions this RDD, this resilient distributed data sets, and how you can actually see how it does that and why you should sometimes reorder that or repartition it to get better results. I'm not going to spend too much time on it. It has nice uh, com- um, code snippets that explain everything. And it's just a very nice, simple, everything is here article. This is stuff that you basically have to f- scrounge around for to figure out how was it again? Is it this? Is it that? This is put it all nice on one page. So just because I like it, I'm going to put it on the show notes. Very good. Very good. For all these Spark yeah. others out there. So my next one is is uh, of a similar nature in that it's it's quite uh, uh, it's quite short, um, but I'm a sucker for a good visualization, and this has a great visualization in it. So this is the uh, Black Friday 2016 uh, mobile versus desktop user behavior, uh, and it's published at the appinstitute.com. Um, and there's some stuff about Black Friday and how Americans spend billions of dollars. Um, but the, the the best thing about it is there's a um, <laughs> a, a visualization that allows you to see um, the clock winding forward from sort of uh, you know, zero zero in the morning all the way through to the end of the day, um, and the sort of people uh, making purchases from mobiles, from tablets, and from desktops are represented by little balls. And uh, as time progresses, the balls go from a, a big cluster in the centre, and they they disappear out to uh, to the uh, the sort of outliers of what they're spending their money on, so sports or TV or uh, jewellery and watches, books and magazines. And it's one of those things that's just it's very soothing to watch. You just see all these little balls bouncing around like some kind of crazed, deranged ball pit, uh, and it's uh, yeah, it's really really interesting. Um, just watching it flicker past, uh, very soothing, uh, and uh, all driven by big data. Yeah, it's a very nice visualization. Yeah, well, when you read the title, I just quickly looked it up, and I'm looking at it now. It's, it's, it's very nice, very nicely done. Is this Ajax, or is this HTML5, or is it... What is this? Inspect. SVG, wow. It's all being uh, rendered on the fly. That's a very yeah. nice visualization. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm a sucker for a great visualization, and that that did it for me. So uh, maybe it'll do it for yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's not just only pretty; it also does what it's supposed to do. It gives you the information yeah, yeah. you want. It's very effective. Yeah. So I yeah. just wish there was a faster button. Oh, there is a faster button. Yeah. Look at that. There is one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's nice. There you go. Looking Excellent. at colored dots on the screen. <laughs> very soothing <laughs> and over to you over uh, to me my penultimate one is a let me get the link on my desktop it's on the Principa uh, website mm-hmm. and uh, if I'm not mistaken they, yeah, those are a South African company of uh, data scientists and Robin Davies uh, wrote a little uh, blog entry there, the top predictive analytics pitfalls to avoid. And I know we've talked before on the podcast about how people love to talk about their successes and what's right, but not really talking about things you shouldn't do. <clears throat> yes. Excuse me. And this actually goes into that uh, specific aspect of predictive analytics, because predictive analytics are being used for everything and anything, and you try to predict everything possible. And we've talked about this before already, that sometimes you don't really take enough time to look at what you're actually predicting to see if it makes sense. 
And yep. <laughs> there are a couple of other pitfalls in there. And this article just has a list of them. It's about one, two, three, four, five, six, out, uh, well, about a dozen of them. And there's very simple ones in there, like bias in your training date and, over, and the, the overfitting chestnut, as they call it. But there's also yep. things like not being creative with the provided data. And this one I love, expecting machines to understand your business. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a real yeah. nice uh, spread of things that they talk about. And it's a good read if you're doing machine learning and you know what you're doing with machine learning. From time to time, I, f I find myself getting into a, a kind of a rut where I do the same thing the same way and I don't even think about what I'm doing anymore. It's like I get data, I have to slice it, dice it and do something. And you don't, I don't even look at the data anymore sometimes. And reading something like this just wakes me up again. And yeah, there's so much things that can go wrong. And in the end result, sometimes you don't really see it, the problem anymore until, of course, well, you predict something for next week. And when next week comes along, it turns out it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, you can think about some elections. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go into that. <laughs> no, no, we're keeping politics out of this. But uh, it's a nice article. It's well written. It's nicely detailed. And I'll put the link in the show notes as always. Good stuff. Okay. Um, so I, I, I saw that one and you saw the one that I'm just about to talk about as well. So And I knew you were going to pick around. it, so I didn't. Yeah, there we go. Um, so uh, my last one is... Uh, AI machine attempts to understand comic books and fails. So there's there's actually uh, um, uh, the article I initially found is on the uh, MIT Technology Review, um, but uh, which is it's you know, quite a high level um, uh, sort of picture of what they uh, what the folks at, uh, at uh, the Academic Institute actually started looking at. Uh, but if you um, if you follow through, and we'll put the link in the show notes, as always, um, there's actually the full academic paper, so you can go into a bit more depth about what they actually did. So, you know, looking at um, 3,948 different comic books, which is uh, about 198,000 uh, pages, or 1.2 million uh, panels, with about 2.5 million text boxes. And uh, yes, trying to sort of do some do some basic OCR on the uh, um, on the text boxes and trying to understand exactly what was happening um, as as part of the uh, uh, the comic. And unsurprisingly, um, you know, if you've looked at a comic book ever, uh, you'll know that the the sort of the text that what happens is, you know, if you're lucky about. I don't know, 10, 20 percent maybe of the the overall uh, intent as to what's happening. Um, maybe it's a little bit more than that. Maybe I'm being slightly unkind, but essentially, um, the big picture is very often uh, very often missed, and uh, it's it's clear that uh, machine learning is not ready to read comics quite yet. Uh, but maybe it just needs to read more of them. Who knows? But yeah, just a bit of fun, um, and uh, yeah, it just made me chuckle. Yeah, I took I've saw that one too, and I kind of rejected it not because I thought you was going to use it, but because it was too fluffy, because it didn't really talk about anything in depth. But now that you found the actual academic paper behind it, I'm really interested. So I'm looking forward to getting that link from you. Yeah, okay. Because the the one thing I was a bit disappointed in the in the I mean, the, they this they conclude that computers can't read comics, but maybe the conclusion is that they don't know how to model a machine learning model to do this yeah and uh, the article didn't really give you enough information to to make a decision on that thing because they have so many algorithms out there and so many approaches to do something like this because it's it's visual it's contextual you need a neural network for this kind of stuff it gave a not really not enough information but really curious to read the uh, technical uh, paper on that yep well, you'll see it in the show notes. Because I hope they also made it with the uh, sarcasm article from a couple of weeks ago. Because, <laughs> I mean, comics and sarcasm, that has to go together, right? <laughs> yeah, match made in heaven. <laughs> okay, right. great stuff. Excellent. Um, I'm going to finish off here with uh, a shout out to the ODPI people. Uh, if you have listened, of course, you have to our anniversary episode. We had uh, John Murtick from the ODPI on and he announced that ODPI was going to be releasing its 2.0 release. And that has happened in the meantime. So I'm going to put a link in the show notes about that as well. So you can read up on that. 
because ODPI, I think it's, it's an important something and it's going to get more and more important in the future, I think. Yeah, yeah. And it's moving in a nice direction. Yeah. Um, so adding adding operation specification into it, mm-hmm. I think, is a, can only be a good thing. So, yeah. yeah, looking forward to it. Really seem to be doing it the right way. So definitely keep an eye on it. So unless you have something else to add on this section. That's it for me. All the links, as always, will be in the show notes. And after we come back after the music, we are going to be talking about the Apache Software Foundation. Stay tuned. And welcome back. So... As Jon mentioned, um, the the meat of this episode is actually about the Apache Software Foundation. Um, you may sort of have noticed when we're introducing the podcast, we talk about this Apache Hadoop thing rather than just Hadoop. And many of the tools and technologies and projects that we, we mention are also Apache projects. Um, and if you've not looked into this before, one of the things you might be wondering is, what the hell is this Apache thing? Um, so first of all, I'd recommend you go to, and of course there'll be a link in the show notes, www.apache.org, and uh, you know start browsing from there. That will give you a, a really good picture of what uh, the ASF is about, the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, but if you haven't got time for all those words, then just spend the next uh, 20 minutes or so listening to us, and uh, hopefully you'll have a better idea as to what the ASF is all about, what it does, and what it brings to the table. So um, I thought the, the, the bit I thought was most interesting about this as I was researching it was the, the, the history behind it. Now, some of this I knew, or at least some of this I thought I knew, and some of this was actually um, was actually sort of news to me. But um, the foundation was actually created in uh, 1999 by a group of people that called themselves the Apache Group. Um, and they'd actually come together several years earlier to uh, continue support and make, supporting and maintaining the HTTPD web server, which was uh, originally written by uh, the NCSA. Um, what happened, as, as is what happens with many open source projects, you know, that sort of code came out. Um, it was licensed under a license that allowed very open modification and redistribution. Um, but the original developers really kind of lost interest uh, in that project, moving on to something else and leaving users with no real way to carry on supporting it, to carry on moving the project forward. Um, basically, some of those users started to exchange fixes, which they called patches, uh, and information on how to prevent problems and improve the existing software. Um and uh, someone, a guy named, uh, and I apologize if I butcher this name, uh, Brian Blendhoff, uh, created a mailing list on his own machine uh, for those users to collaborate, fix, maintain, and improve that software. Um, so the name Apache was cho- uh, chosen uh, in respect to the Native American Apache Nation, well known for their superior skills in warfare strategy and their inexhaustible endurance. Um, the, and the thing that uh, I thought was quite amusing is uh, it also makes a cute pun on the Apache web server, i.e. a web server made up of a series of patches. Uh, but that's a that's a retroactive pun. Um, that was not the actual origin. Um, so the the group of developers that banded around this uh, this uh, web server basically released their their new version of the software, and they started to call themselves the Apache Group. Um, so between sort of 1995 and 1999, the Apache HTTPD web server created by the Apache group became sort of the leader of the market and still really is with uh, more than 65% of the world's websites powered by Apache. Um, so everything started to grow and uh, and more and more projects uh, became a sort of sister projects to that website and to that web server. So the ModPerl project, the PHP project, um, the Java Apache project. Uh, and so more and more um, projects sort of came under this umbrella. Um, and you can, you can hear more about this on the actual detail of the uh, uh, Apache website. But I think it was, it was really interesting to... 
um, for me, for me personally, to kind of go all the way back to the very beginning and the very core of what Apache was created around is is really kind of collaboration um, and and sort of the meritocracy of uh, of contributions. Yeah, so they were also kind of at the birth of the real internet. I mean, the internet was built on uh, defense environments where people like you and me didn't touch it. But the time that we touched it was when the NCSA HTTP demon became publicly known and the web was created. And that's pretty much when they started as well. So this whole collaborative do program for good and join and play together and just share everything that just came along with the whole internet web thing. That's nice. Yeah, yeah. And this, 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 this sort of meritocracy approach um, that came in alongside this was that um, you know the group as a whole when that when they felt that a new a new person had earned their merit uh, to be part of that community you know they'd been given enough um, contributing enough code you know making enough useful positive comments on things um, they were then given sort of direct access to the uh, the code repository thus increasing the group and increasing the ability of the group to uh, to develop and maintain the the, the project yeah it's actually a nice uh, thing to, to to note a lot of people when they talk about apache say it's a democratic a democratic uh, model but it isn't it's a meritoc- meritocratic model which is better in yeah. my opinion it wouldn't work in real yeah. life and real politics but in something like a yeah, project structure which every kind of software project is and meritocracy works very, very well as long as you have the right people at the top and as long as those are being chosen by that same merito- merito- meritocratic system, difficult word, yeah. that, well, usually works out pretty well if you look at the uh, Apache projects that exist today. Yeah, very much so. Um, so that's kind of a brief outline of kind of where they came from uh, or where the, the overall Apache Software came, Foundation came from. I mean, it is a uh, it is a non profit public charity organization, um, and it's. Um, it, I mean, it basically functions like any ordinary company. You know, they have a a board of directors. Um, they have um, individual sort of uh, what they call PMCs, project uh, management committees. Um, which are each sort of uh, project under the ASF has a, uh, a PMC team. And then you have um, sort of uh, committers who are people which are, you know, actually have right access to the individual code repositories. Um, then you also have, you know, developers um, or contributors as they're sometimes known. So those are people that uh, you know, contribute to the project in the form of code or documentation um, maybe you're active on mailing lists, you know, produce patches um, and documentation suggestions. They provide those upstream, but it's actually the committers that take those and decide whether or not they're going to actually include those into the upstream code. So again, the, the committers are, you know, can be seen as the gatekeepers um, for these individual projects. Well, that's called reviewers. It's a review process going on there, right? Yeah, very much so. And also, when yeah. somebody becomes a committer, there's usually a party. Oh, yeah, because, absolutely. Uh, it's not that easy to become a committer. You really have to show dedication, good code writing, having a sense of community, helping people, and that's how you can become a committer. Yeah. Um, so there's there's a, a number of different sort of, um, sort of pieces of the, of the ASF, um, but... One of the things that I, I like to, uh, to to focus on is if you uh, just go to the Apache.org website and you scroll down towards the bottom, um, you'll see a, an Apache project list. And uh, Jan, I'll give you uh, a little bit of time to, to think about it, but uh, I'd just like you to think about what your favorite Apache project is that's on that list. Because you'll see, if you are, if you're following along with us uh, and you have a computer in front of you, um, you'll see there's a whole bewildering uh, list of projects under the uh, the Apache um, banner, if you like. Uh, and I can see sort of, you know, s- quite a few that I recognize and also quite a few that I don't recognize. And I spent a little bit of time early on today taking a quick look at some of the more interesting, different and uh, interesting ones. 
But uh, the one that I that I like the most is definitely Apache Whimsy, <laughs> um, and if you if you follow through and, and take a look at that, the Apache Whimsy is is actually a site where absolutely unnecessary and yet quite often handy applications are deployed, <laughs> <laughs> which I just thought was brilliant. Um, there are some services which are open to the public. There are some services that are only uh, open to committers. Um, you know, some are members only. Some are open to officers and, and members and that sort of thing. Um, but the if you look at one of the um, uh, one of the ones that are open to the public, it actually has what they call the incubator podlings, i.e., incubator projects that are still in the Apache incubator stage. Um, Sorted by age, which I thought was quite uh, quite useful. So you can see, um, so the oldest Apache incubator project, for example, is Apache Wave. That's been in incubation since 2010, which is a long time. Um, so what, what does it the, mean um, to be in incubation? So we'll we'll come through to that in a, okay. in in a little bit, if that's okay. But um, essentially, the, I just thought Apache Whimsy, great name, um, and. <laughs> It is exactly what it says on the, on the tin. A few kind of random services that uh, are just kind of completely unnecessary, but quite amusing at the same time. So, with that in mind, what's your uh, what's your favourite Apache project, Jon? Well, I think I got two. I mean, if you're going for purely whimsical names, and I like Cupid, it's a, a lot better name than <laughs> AMQP. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a project for it. And actually, my favorite one, just by pure how much I've used it, is uh, the simple web server itself. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it, it's not listed. It, I can't see it under Apache and I can't see it under HTTP either. So, what's it called these days? Web server or something? Uh, it says web services that's a good is there. Question. But I always thought good it was just question. HTTP. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Mm, interesting. Perhaps they're not all there after all. Well, they're not, because remember last uh, in, the, in the anniversary episode, uh, Joe talked about how Minify isn't a top-level project, but a sub-project of yeah. NiFi. And if you look at the list, you will not see Minify. No. And okay, no, apparently true. there is a Apache HTTP server project, so it's called HTTP server. Uh, yes, it's right at the top, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, Apache web server HTTPD. Yeah. yeah, it's actually right at the top of that list. Yeah, they, they put it outside of the alphabetic list just to make it hard on us. <laughs> yeah, just to make life a little bit difficult. You should think about us poor podcasters making us make it difficult like this. Yeah, or, you know, we could do some research. But then what's the fun of that, eh? <laughs> Doing research? Nah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so... Um, you mentioned a, a really good point, which is um, about the actual uh, project themselves. So the ASF is not just, um, you know, some something that uh, provides, you know, PMC members and, and a structure around committers and that sort of thing. But it actually provides a, a lot of um, overall governance towards the, the structure of a project. Um, so, for example, when you first come up with a project, it goes into, uh, you know, gets voted on and, you know, names get chosen and they get voted on and they have to pass, a, you know, a fairly rigorous set of, um, of of checks to make sure that it's a, it can be a valid name and there won't be any copyright issues and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, what was the previous name for Ranger? Oh, man. If you told me that in advance, I would have looked it up. <laughs> Um, anyway, that's uh, that's a, a question left to the audience. It, it comes up now and again, and I always forget it. But anyway, um, so you know, projects do change as uh, as they go through uh, as they go through sort of various pieces of their um, uh, their overall progress. But essentially, you know, you start off with um, some of the basics. So communication. The bulk of the communication is done. Um, through mailing lists, and mailing lists are provided by the Apache uh, project infrastructure. Uh, documentation, each project is responsible for its own project website, which again is made available through the, the SF infrastructure. Um, also, projects are you know, normally kind of 
auto governing, I guess you could say. Um, sometimes refer, referred to as the duocracy, the power of those who do, um, which functions you know pretty well in most cases. Um, voting is done with a you know a plus one, a zero, or you know if you abstain or have no opinion, or a minus one if you uh, if you vote that that shouldn't go forward. Um, but it's really all about you know forming that consensus or you know, having an alternative proposal that resolves the issue. Um, and it's it's certainly seen as a very key part of the overall um, community. Um, you'll also see there's a uh, you know, there's six principles which are cited as the core beliefs uh, and the philosophy behind the foundation. So collaborative software development sounds good. Uh, commercial friendly standard license, uh, consistently high quality software, uh, respectful, honest, technical based interaction, faithful implementation of standards, and security as a mandatory feature. Um, and all of the ASF projects um, should s- share these principles. Um, so there's there's a lot of you know structure and um, and you know even things like philosophy that gets passed on down to. Um, projects as being part of the ASF. So when you start off a project, um, you know you get you get given. Um, assuming you make the cut, you get given incubator status. So, as the name suggests, that's um, uh, the process of actually you know, starting up a project or a new sub project. Um, the creation of the project, the creation of the infrastructure that we've just talked about to, that needs to support it. Um, Evaluate the sort of the maturity of the project. Um, so one of the things is the, you know your you have to have a a, de- a working code base. You know you can't just come up with a a project go straight to a a full project if you actually haven't got any real code. Funnily enough, um, <laughs> small but important point. Um, but how you how do you, you sell act- vaporware then? Come on. Yeah, unfortunately, not not with, not under the Apache Software Foundation. Um, but you also have to have um, you know the incubation period is about increasing that uh, the diversity of the committer base. Um, so you know a lot of these projects start out uh, within the ASF with you know one maybe one primary organization pushing it, and maybe a few sort of other contributors outside of that core organization. Um, but for a project to survive, it actually needs to, um, you know, increase the diversity of committers that are contributing to the project and playing a part in the project and PMC members. Um, so again, the the sort of the focus of the ASF is really about not just um, projects that are driven by a single organisation, but projects that are really driven by a whole community. And I think it's one of the things that's really important, and you may or may not have seen in the news some fairly recently some sort of back and forth about the Cassandra project and its potential violation of these uh, uh, these guidelines or these these rules um, and sort of some of the reorganizations that have gone on within the project because of that. Um, mm. I think there, there are two sides to every story, but I think the the core of the message is is good in my view. You know, to try and build an overall community so that the um, the success of a particular project is not just reliant on you know one particular organisation uh, pushing forward the development, but actually you know a whole community building it together. Yeah, it's just essential for the longevity of a project, and if you want anybody to become a contributor, committer, maybe PMC member on the project. If I would look at what am I going to commit to, I want something that has some longevity in its future. And this yep. really helps. And it also means you can't move from a meritocracy to a dictatorship. Yeah. And, and also it provides, um, you know, if you've got people coming at the same piece of software, which is you know, maybe solving the same technical issue from a couple of different perspectives, then you're going to get, you're just going to get a better rounded solution because yep. not everyone's focus you know laser focused on exactly the same point so you're going to have a variety of different visions on the technology which is you know just going to give um you know a more realistic and more well-rounded uh, overall solution which is 
basically all about making sure that the the software finds a, a good real life use outside of the uh, outside of just being developed. Yeah, it also helps avoid uh, too much prolif- proliferation because it makes more sense for people to work together on the project because you know nobody's going to be the mastermind. It's, it's going to be a collaborative effort. So instead of making your own project, your own Git page somewhere, just if you if what you're making, if your addition is useful, present it to the existing project, and if it is useful, you will probably get in. Yeah, and just become yeah, added yeah. to a bigger to a bigger hole, and uh, yeah, collaboration always wins in the end. Very much so. Um, so I mean, that's that's kind of for me. That's the core of what um, the Apache Software Foundation is about, and the Apache Software License is about. You're not going to talk about the attic. Go for it. The attic, as since there's, there's an incubation stage, then there's a project stage, and if you get uh, deprecated or obsolesced, you go to the Apache attic. Well, there you go. It's on the Wikipedia page, so it must be true. Who's in the attic now? That's what I. That's was a pretty long list, actually. I think uh, I saw it on the Wikipedia page for uh, Apache Foundation. At the bottom, you have to see also you have Apache attic and incubator. If you go to attic, there's Avalon. Axkit, Beehive, the C++ standard library, <laughs> Click, Crimson, Excalibur. It's about, I don't know, two yeah, dozen. There's, there's, yeah, no, more than that, there's the whole uh, Jakarta's there. Yeah, yeah, there's a blast from yeah, the past. A... <laughs> a regexp. Oh, that's... regexp. Regexp has officially been obsoleted. People stop using oh. them. <laughs> no, even better. The uh, uh, XML. XML is in there. It's dead. <laughs> Yes, everybody can stop using XML. I suppose everybody's using JSON now, aren't they? Mm. Uh, well, it depends, uh, depending on the... T- <laughs> if you look at HBase, for example, it's a lot easier to work with XML than with JSON, though. Yeah, it true. true. More hoops. It's a preference thing. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, no, that's that's a very very good catch. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. the attic is where dead projects go. <laughs> yeah, I thought if, you, if you're going to talk about... You have to talk the whole circle of life, right? Not just This the, is true. This is true. But it's good that they have um, actually a, a, a process to obsolesce, to obsolete stuff, because sometimes something gets replaced or just isn't maintained anymore. You need to have a process in place as well to make sure that those don't craft along. Yeah. So it's a, it's yeah. a well-thought-out system, and they've got pretty much every, every, every corner, every angle covered. And it yeah. makes for pretty reliable and stable projects. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, one thing I wanted to just kind of briefly touch on is a lot of people think about um, the Apache Software Foundation in the way that we've just been describing it. But a lot of piece, people also think about the Apache Software Foundation really as the Apache license, mm-hmm. the license that you apply to the software. Um, and if you're sort of focused on that, and if you want to understand what the difference is between you know ver- a variety of different licenses, um, there's actually a great website that I recommend you look at, and we will put a note in the show notes. Uh, but it's actually just choosealicense.com, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it keeps it really, really simple. Uh, it clusters sort of licenses into three main groups. Um, so the um, the sort of far left hand side, if you like, is uh, you want your license very simple and very permissive, short and to the point, um, where you know it lets people do anything they want with your code as long as they provide attribution back to you and don't hold you liable. Um, then you apply something like the uh, MIT license. Um, if you're concerned about patents, um, then you can use the Apache license, which is um, a permissive license similar to the MIT license, but it also um, provides an express grant of patent rights uh, from contributors to users. Um, and then, you know, towards the right-hand side, you've got the the full I care about sharing improvements, and uh, you've got the GNU, the GNU license, the GPL v3, which is a copyleft license that requires anyone who distributes your code or a derivative work to make the source available under the same terms and provides an express grant of patent rights from contributors to users. And it gives an example of various different projects um, that use these various different licenses as well. Um, there are also other types of licenses, like the uh, like the Creative Commons and that sort of thing. It's a bit, no, it's different. bit out it's of the... Uh, yeah. The one I'm missing here it's actually not, is the not. BSD license. 
Very true. Because Very true. But if you if you scroll down or if you click the uh, the link at the bottom that says I want more choices, more licenses ah. are available. <laughs> and then you've got the like, the Mozilla license. Yeah, but uh, still no BSD. The unlicensed. No, you're right. The BSD one isn't there. still exists, that's doesn't it? Because I've got a free NAS server here, and that's using the BSD license, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. And it doesn't, because BSD is also a thing that uh, Apple actually is using for their operating system, because that's based on, uh, uh, not on the free BSD, but on BSD standard. But express intent that if they went went with Linux, they would have to do with with the GPL. And by going with the BSD version, which is not Linux, they can actually resell it and keep it all private. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, no, it's definitely still around. So I guess the um, BSD license is just too, too, I would say, too restrictive to be even be on this uh, open. It's not okay. It said choose an open source license. I guess you could say BSD is not an open source license. Uh, and then, uh, it's the only. I'm trying. Okay, I'm trying. <laughs> no, I disagree with that because it is actually listed on the open source initiative, the BSD three cores license. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I guess it just doesn't make it onto that onto that cut of that particular chooserlicense.com website. But we'll we'll give them some feedback and yeah. see if they'll update it. But I just thought it was it was a nice way of um, yeah, nice. outlining the different types of licenses because really. I mean, I, I grew up in the land of Linux, so the GPL was was really all I knew for a long time. Um, and then, you know, Apache stuff started to uh, swim into my uh, into my world. And uh, now, you no, know, most of most things that I do are either kind of a, or do or use, I should say, are either um, Apache or GPL. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but for me, the the license thing is it's a nice thing to be there. I mean, the Apache license really gives you a pretty clear thing what you can and can't do and a lot of uh, commercial semi-commercial entities that want to use open source well the apache license pretty much what they can work with but for me the 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 main goodness of apache is the project structure and uh, the stability they give to that agreed agreed and i think that's that's what i that's what i like most about i mean to a certain extent, I don't really care whether the license of something that I'm using is GPL or Apache, but I really do. Well, your employer does. That's true, but I really do like. And not, not specifically meaning your employer, I mean everybody's employer does. <laughs> true, true. But I really do like the uh, the additional structure um, yep. that the Apache Software Foundation brings to their projects. If you look at it compared to. Any, I've I've never seen um, apart from you know closed source organisations that you know have their direction. That's the way they go. That's the way they do it. That's all fine. Mm-hmm. But that sort of collaboration, really formalised for the good of the software, yeah. I think is. I just think it's a really, really you know nice way of doing things. And yeah, you know, long may it continue. Yeah, and do correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the MIT license or the GNU license have that kind of structure behind them. I mean, GNU has yeah. a website where you can put some stuff. I, I guess. But they don't really have that kind of a contributor, committer, PMC member, make sure you do it right or you will be kicked out stuff. I don't no. know of anything like that in those regions. No, no. And I think that's that's one of the things that the Apache Software Foundation, I think, is. It's, I think it's the, for me, it's the most powerful thing about it, that sort of level of control yeah. around it that really does... You know, collaborate. Yeah, for me as a yeah, pre-sales person, when I go to a customer and I have to solve a problem and I have a little project, I think, now this is good for you. If it's an Apache project, it kind of settles in my mind, okay, this is stable, this is usable, this is not going to have disappeared in another of six months or so. You can use this, it'll work for you. It's not going to be everlasting, it'll change, it's still open source, but you have some stability there. If it's not an uh, Apache project, I'm actually reticent to use it in a production environment if you're just playing around and trying things out yeah sure try try whatever you want it's fun but if you want to put something in place it has to have some kind of stability I, I i like having the apache name in front of the project yeah 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 very much so very much so. i couldn't agree more so question for you Mm-hmm. Go for it. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer it, but <laughs> well I, I know an answer but i want to just put a question there because it's a question I've, i hear a lot from people Okay. Does Apache equal open source software? Uh, depends what you mean. Do you mean is that is it the only way to get open source software, or 
is only open source software on the Apache? What do you mean? Uh, just that. I mean, a lot of people do, people use the, a lot of the time, sorry, people use the two terms inter- intermingled when they mean one and they say the other. Yeah. And that's something, there's a bit of awareness in there because not all open source is Apache. And I'm yep. pretty much sure that all Apache is open source in some way or form, yeah. but things that are yeah. in Apache don't have to have started out life as open source. A lot of companies are no, putting no. commercial software now under the Apache umbrella, usually under a different name, because Apache wants its own name always to make sure there's no infringements going on. But so is Apache all open source? Well, it is now, but it doesn't always have, must have been. Is that English? I think so. <laughs> it's close to English. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's as yes, good as it gets, man. <laughs> code, code within the ASF is all definitely open source. It may have started off as closed source proprietary. My favorite example of that is, um, you know, what became Apache Ranger was a closed source proprietary project called XA Secure. Mm-hmm. You know, Hortonworks uh, acquired the company and uh, opens, you know, cleaned up and open sourced the code, which then uh, then became Apache Ranger. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, it may have come from a closed source um, a closed source world before, but once you know, contributing it to Apache, uh, it must be open source. Yeah, and major companies are doing this now. I mean, I work at Microsoft, so I have to talk about Microsoft a little bit every time. But we just recently open sourced a bunch of stuff as well. I mean, the whole new deep learning toolkit is an open source license. Uh, the open sourced uh, PowerShell as well, which I never used to be honest. Uh, I like the Bash extensions more. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, somehow, for some reason, big company, big business has drank the Apache open source Kool-Aid. What do you think made this happen in the recent time? I'm going to give it to you because you're the real open source person here, right? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I've been using open source software um, in enterprise environments for over 20 years now. So I... I struggle to see it that way because I've been in environments where it, it's just been the thing to use. Um, do I think I don't really think that um, I don't really think that large corporations care whether it's Apache or GPL that they that they're using. You know, the common example, of course, is is Linux. If someone's using you know RHEL or CentOS, um, then you know, as long as they have a, a commercial relationship for the most part, you know, someone they can call and shout at if there are any problems. Um, I don't really think that the majority of big business really cares about the uh, the underlying license. I think it's kind of geeks and nerds like us that really care about, you know, things like the project structure and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but now we're talking about the companies using open source. I was talking about companies donating to open source. Yeah, so I. Yeah, putting on the spot there, man. Is, Come on. Yeah, that's somewhat different. I'm not sure that I still see enough contribution from companies. It is definitely building, um, but I still think it's it's relatively it's relatively young in that space, and I don't think it's an Apache thing or a or a GPL thing. I think it's just a. Um, you know, large commercial organizations are not used to, to giving away what they view as their IP, their intellectual property. Um, and I think it takes a, it, it does take a different view of things to be contributing to open source with, within those kind of organizations. It's definitely changing and it definitely is happening. Um, but it's, it's still a long way off being a regular normal thing. Agree? Disagree? Um, I would disagree slightly. I mean, you're right, but I think it's more than just occasional. It's really happening a lot. And I think some big companies actually have drunk the Kool-Aid and are trying to do it more in a uh, open source fashion. And obviously, big businesses, they do it for the money. I mean, and that's a good thing because I want to get paid at the end of the month. And so do you, dear listener. Mm-hmm. What I'm seeing a shift in is that big business no longer sees software as a cash cow because software changes so often and proprietary software just doesn't keep up with open source software. And with its shift of a lot of companies moving from a license system to a more of a service-based system, 
If you look at all the new startups, they're all doing service things. If you look at Uber, they distribute software, but that's not their money system. Yeah. It's a service. And from that point of view, software becomes less of a, it's my IP. It's okay. Patents are still important. They always will be patents, but it's less of a scary thing to let go because it's not your cash go anymore. It's the service around it. And if more people contribute to the software to making your service better, why not? Just make sure that yeah. there's one, two, three secret sauce things you have, that those are kept inside, that you don't you know, leave everything out because then you have a competitor that can just do the same thing and you lose your differentiation, of course. But for the most of it, I do think that uh, big business has seen open source as the way of the future. Well, I certainly, I certainly believe that to be the case. I guess uh, time will tell. Time always tells. <laughs> and on that bombshell... <laughs> Exactly. Anything else? Uh, just want to remind our listeners that we did have a episode 11 uh, somewhere in April 2016 where we had Venkatesh Salapa on the show who was actually uh, talking to us about how to become a uh, Apache contributor committer. So if you have more uh, questions about what part to take and what the uh, stumbling blocks are along the way and what the best practices are to become a good committer, go and listen to episode 11. And uh, let us know what you think. Yeah, definitely. And in fact, I'm pretty sure that uh, although you couldn't, when I think we uh, um, initially recorded the episode, because we recorded it before he'd actually presented, you can also find his slides up on SlideShare now, because uh, that, that session obviously went uh, public quite some time ago. But yeah, yeah, very good, very good point. Go and check out Venkatesh's uh, session on uh, and the, uh, the the joy of becoming an active member of an Apache Software Foundation project. Well, he sounded very enthusiastic about it, so it must be fun. Absolutely. And I would love to be one, but who has the time? That's what I wonder. How do these guys do this, having a full day's work and have enough time to be a committer? <sighs> I, think, I think that no, you've got it right there. <laughs> Part of their job is that they need to be a committer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Still... That's all. That's all we have. That's about all we have time for on this particular topic. I hope you enjoyed this serving of bite-sized big data ASF style. We'll be back in two weeks' time with a brand new episode. Uh, until then, please go to www.roaringelephant.org where you can find out more information, send us your questions, and please give us a five-star review on iTunes if you use iTunes. I still don't like iTunes, but I respect those that do. Um, it really does help new users discover the podcast and help broaden, broaden our audience. If you don't think we deserve the full five stars, that's okay as well. But in that case, please send us some feedback via the feedback form on our website or drop us an email to podcast at roaringelephant.org with any thoughts, comments, criticisms and any other feedback. My name is Dave. And my name is Jon. And we look forward to talking to you in two weeks' time. Bye.